Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. A quick little invitation to all of you IB Economic students to head on over to my website, bradcartwright.com, a website designed to help you improve your scores in IB Economics, whether that be on an in-class quiz, a test, or ultimately the IB exam. So if you want some more information, check out the description box below. And other than that, enjoy this video. All right, now let's take a look at something called the poverty cycle. The poverty cycle is a term used to talk about a situation, a generational situation, where those who are born in poverty have a very difficult time earning their way out of poverty. And I want to make a really important point here and, and really put this in your mind. Like, look, the reason why people in poverty has more to do with where they are in their generational cycle than, the, than their actual effort themselves. So what I mean by that is that if you take a serious look at your own family, no matter where you are in your socioeconomic standing right now in your particular country, at some point you're back at the farm, right? You're back in a place where you're not wealthy. And, and, and you may be wealthy now, but if you really looked at it, like if I really look at my family, we came from Scotland, and my great-grandfather got on a boat in 1912, and he had a sixth grade education. He came to the U.S., he was a carpenter, he had two children, my grandfather got a high school education. My grandfather worked hard, he worked his way up into management, and as a result of that, my mother had a university education. And so when I came along, you know, the expectation to go to university was, was never talked about because it was just implied, yeah? And so as a result of that, I come from a place in a generational cycle of the top, right? Because a university education in this planet is the ticket to sit down to try to get any job, pretty much. So did I work for my university education? Of course I worked. But am I solely responsible by working harder than somebody else? No. And in fact, you could argue that my job as a teacher, like I'm not really working that hard compared to somebody who's doing physical or manual labor. Okay, so I just want to say that because you got to look at this from a really holistic standpoint and a really honest and heartfelt standpoint because poverty is way beyond the powers of any individual, oftentimes generational, and I think we'll see in this, in this video that, that it's pretty hard to argue against that, okay? So let's just have that in our minds as we look through this, okay? So the first thing I want to do is lay out two terms that are used by international organizations to make assessments of relative poverty between nations. Okay. The first one is something called relative poverty. And the definition of this is a person is said to be in relative poverty if they do not reach some specified level of income in that particular country. So, for example, a poverty level of 50% on average earnings may be set in a country and anyone who earns less than this would be deemed to be relatively poor. Okay, so they set up, the government sets up a number that's like, you know, maybe like, like 100% or some salary that would be, where people would be able to pay for the standard of living that is, is, that is desired in that particular nation. And then anybody who's underneath that 50% would be considered to be relatively poor. Okay, so hold on to that term because we're going to add to it something called absolute poverty which is the level of absolute poverty is measured in terms of the basic necessities for survival. In this level of income, that is sufficient. It is the level of income that is sufficient to buy items such as basic clothing, food, and shelter. So we're talking about, you know, people who are ba just barely getting enough money together in order to take care of their basic needs, of course, of food, um, clothing, and shelter. Okay, and you know, I had an experience in life. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Dominican Republic from 2000 to 2002, and I lived in the Campo, 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 way in the countryside. And the people that were there had one common aspect to them, and what it was was they did not have an education. And almost all of those people tended to be the firstborn child in their family. And as a result of that, whether they were a boy, but especially the women, I'm talking about 50, 60 year old women they didn't know how to read. And the reason they didn't know how to read is at the very age that they would have gone off to first grade, which is sixth or seventh grade, they, six or seven years old, they were needed to take care of the younger children that came, around, came along behind them. And so they just never had the opportunity to go to school. They're super intelligent, right? But they live, but what they were able to do was only subsist in, in the countryside 
Why? Because if you can't read, and I'm talking about not being able to recognize your own name on a piece of paper, if you can't read, you can't be a driver. You can't do anything that has to do with transportation, moving from one place to another because you can't read the street signs. You can't go take a driver's test. You can't go get a job at a bank being a security guard because you don't understand the contract that you're signing. So, so these kinds of these kinds of realities are just that. They are realities. They are not a sign of the ability of the person who is, who is living that life as a result of a lack of opportunity. Okay? So the World Bank uses an absolute poverty line of a dollar, US dollar 25 per day. And the way they calculate that is something called purchase, uh, purchase power, purchase power, purchasing power parity, <laughs> PPP. And what that means is you basically take the purchasing power of $1.25 and, and look at the exchange rate in a particular country and figure out how much money that would be. Okay, that's a very, very little amount of money. And of course, if you multiply $1.25 times 30, you're talking roughly about $40 a month um, in terms of income. Okay, so that's what is considered to be absolute poverty. And so if you take a look, and this comes from Jocelyn Blink, who I've mentioned and I use as my main source throughout this entire um, course is uh, put together this pretty interesting chart and it just looks at the places where you know that have the highest rate of absolute poverty and so this is population below a poverty line or absolute poverty line and the, these are in percentages right so take a, these are the countries of Mali Nigeria Central African Republic Zambia uh, Niger and Madagascar and the thing you see is that like 51 percent of the people in um, Mali live below a dollar 25 a day and that's half, right? 64 in Nigeria, 62 in the Central African Republic, 64 in Zambia, 65 in, Ni in Niger, and 67% in Madagascar don't even make more than a dollar a day, dollar 25 a day, okay? And you can see the people that make $2 a day, like 89% of people in Madagascar make under, 89% make under $2 a day. So imagine if that were your reality. That's what you have to do. You have to imagine if that's your reality. Like what would be available to you? If you're only making $2 a day, do you have the same opportunities to go to school as somebody who's making more? No. And it doesn't matter about your necessary abilities or your desires or your hopes or how hard you work. No, it's about where you're born in a generational cycle, okay? And, and, and I want you in your analysis and evaluation as you look through this whole development process, because as I said at the beginning, like you got to collect all of this information, right, slowly as you go through this course in order to be fully informed about what it truly means to be developed. Um, but absolute poverty is a, is a generational thing. Relative poverty is a generational thing. If I'd been born four, five generations back, I'd have a sixth grade education and that's it, okay? All right, now let's take a look at something called the poverty cycle or the poverty trap. I prefer to use the word cycle because cycles can be broken. You know, if you, if you, if you, if you are in a trap, like you can't get out of it. And I don't, I don't necessarily like that idea, okay? I think all people are capable of all things. It's a matter of what their opportunities that they have been afforded by birth, mostly, that allows them to do that, okay? So the where, where you need to look here is like, you, this whole um, diagram, which is very simple, starts in the middle, and you'll see a lot of these poverty cycle, um, um, you know, if you look on the internet or whatnot, a lot of different ways of drawing this. I like this one. This also comes from Jocelyn Blank and Ian Dorton. But this is talking about low income. So the, the heart here is low income, okay? So if you just think about the, a country or a family with low income, guess what's going to happen in that country? in that family, just hold on to the family because it's easier, they're gonna, not gonna be able to have that much economic growth. And as a result of that, yeah, um, they're not necessarily gonna have that much money to invest in moving forward. And as a result of that, they're not gonna have that level high of savings, in other words, money to fall back on, which would then, of course, lead then again to low incomes, okay? And these circles can go both ways. I know the arrows are going the other way. But, but this whole cycle right here could be going either way, right? Low savings, why is that? Well, because you don't have that much money, you have a low income, and that, you know, it can go that way as well, okay? So that's growth. The other side over here is pretty interesting. Like, if you have a low income, yeah, in your family, guess what? You're going to have a low level of education, not because you're not smart, but because you don't have, or intelligent, because you don't have the opportunity, right? And healthcare, low level of healthcare. And if you have low level of healthcare, 
then you're have, and this is like, I think a pretty inhumane, not inhumane, but like a pretty harsh way of putting humans. Like you're gonna have low human capital, <laughs> which is a, it basically means in economic terms, like you, you, your value as a person is less as a result of you not having that high of an education or that good of healthcare. And as a result, you're gonna have low productivity, okay? So as a result of having low productivity, you're gonna have a low income. And you can see how families can just get trapped in this cycle of development where they just can't get out of it. And the, the single number one indicator, the thing that would just blow it all open is education. Because I have some good friends um, who are parents uh, of, of fellow parents on a soccer team here in, in, in Lo Barnechea, which is, a, which is a neighborhood outside of Santiago, Santiago Chile. And they, um, they live you know, they have sixth grade educations, they have eighth grade educations, and they live in a very intense public housing um, environment. And in that environment, it's very hard to find a place to escape out of that. And they worry very much about their children's ability to get out of that, but they don't have the ability to pay for private schooling. And while the Chilean government has tried its best to invest in public schools, and they're pretty decent, and there's a relatively high level of primary school that, um, attendance levels here in Chile, the, the level of school is just not that good. And as a result, it's likely that a student that's there is going to end up living in the same, in the same place. But if they are able to get a university degree, they will have a salary that will enable them to pay a rent that is not in that place. And as a result, boom, out of that poverty cycle they go and it's generational change. And so that's why probably your parents are talking about your education, 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 because look, I'm kind of an old dude, but I'm telling you, there are some things that old, wiser, that, that adults are right about. And that is the importance of your education, which is why for me anyway, it's so gratifying um, to be a teacher, okay? So if you take a look at this from a country standpoint, Low, a family or a country with low income is going to have low levels of education and healthcare, low levels of human capital, low levels of productivity, and as a result, it just goes around and around, right? And low levels of income is going to lead to low levels of savings in the country, low levels of investment, low levels of economic growth, back to low incomes, which leads to low productivity, low levels of human capital, low levels of education and healthcare, and around the cycle it goes, right? In the country standpoint, it does like a little figure eight here. Okay, but you know what happens in a country is the same thing that happens in families, and of course, because countries are made up of families, they're going to be connected. All right, so there's the poverty cycle and the poverty trap, and I want you to take a look at that. But I really want you to really lock in to your heart in this um, um, in this whole series because it's really important that you look at humanity as all of us having equal equal abilities, but not necessarily equal opportunities. All right, on to the next video, my friends. Here we go.